Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode oh, 120, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next, oh, almost half hour, I'm going to be ranting away at you at things important to me that I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me directly. The email address is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the email address from there, or you can leave a comment there if you'd rather. Uh, as always, just please be aware that I'm sometimes a little slow about answering my email. I do answer it, but I, sometimes a little slow. And please include something like left side of the aisle, your cable show, something in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. All right, with that, let's get to it. We're going to start, as I always like to, whenever the opportunity arises, to start with some good news. Although, as is too often true these days, the good news has a dark underside. The good news is that a federal judge has ordered the return of $1 million seized during a traffic stop after police presented only a questionable drug-sniffing dog sniff as evidence that the money was associated with some kind of illegal drug activity. All right, that's the good news. The bad news is the entire backstory. In March of 2012, Nebraska state troopers stopped Rajesh and Marina uh, Derry of Montvale, New Jersey. Um, they pulled them over for speeding. According to court documents, the cops obtained consent to search the car. Now, that right away should start raising red flags. Uh, the cops didn't say they had probable cause to search the car. They didn't claim reasonable suspicion to search the car. They said they obtained consent to search the car. In the real world, such consent is usually obtained by verbal tricks, bullying, or implied threats of arrest or detention if you refuse. Cops have been known to go ballistic if you tell them that they can't search your car. Others have been known to use your very refusal to let them search the car as evidence that you're hiding something illegal, giving them reasonable suspicion to search the car anyway. Others have been known to detain drivers held by the side of the road by an armed cop, usually with backup, until a drug-sniffing dog can be brought to the scene, however long that might take. Now, certainly such searches do not happen at all, or even at most traffic stops. But the fact is, they are commonplace enough that people are actually advised to, if the cops want to search your car, go ahead and let them, even if they don't have the authority to do it, even if you are within your legal rights to refuse them, let them do it anyway, because asserting your rights just gets you into more trouble. So the best course is to passively surrender to arbitrary authority. In fact, this is so much so that people are actually advising that even if you do have something illegal in the car, let the cops search anyway because in the long run you're better off just pretending that the Fourth Amendment actually simply does not exist. All right, but the thing I mentioned about drug-sniffing dogs, okay, that brings me back to the, uh, to the case in hand. When they searched the car, the cops found in the trunk a big amount of money, a million dollars in the trunk. As a result of this, they, they arrested the dairies on suspicion of drug activity, illegal drug activity, even though no drugs in the car, no so-called drug paraphernalia in the car, all there was was the money, that was the basis for arresting them. Once at the police station, the cops took the money, they hid it somewhere, and this drug-sniffing dog supposedly was able to locate the money. All right, here's the next red flag, the dogs. Not only are these drug-sniffing dogs notoriously unreliable, I maintain that their very use, by definition, constitutes an invasive search that should require a search warrant. I mean, Consider, the, the, the dogs in essence are devices that the cops are using to detect things unavailable to the eyes, ears, or nose of a human being. Courts wouldn't, at least I hope they wouldn't, approve of the cops routinely, without a warrant, using some x-ray device to look into your trunk in order to see things that they couldn't see with their eyes. So why is a dog, which in essence is being used to allow them to find smells that they otherwise could not find, any different? 
And here's another thing, though, related to the same thing. According to a variety of studies, somewhere between one-third and three-quarters of all U.S. paper money has detectable traces of cocaine. Which means that any pile of bills, even a small one, could possibly produce a so-called hit by one of these drug-sniffing dogs. Which means even if the dog is right about the presence of a cocaine, that still tells, tells the cops absolutely nothing about that money being used for any kind of illegal activity. No matter. Makes no difference. The dog got a hit on the money that the cops took from the dairy's trunk. So the cops decided to keep the money. They let the dairies go. They had nothing to hold them on. No evidence, nothing to indicate that they actually could be arrested for anything illegal. They let them go, but said, we're keeping the million dollars. Now, you may not have heard of this before. If you haven't, it's time you did. This is a corrupted and corruption-ridden outgrowth of the war on drugs. It's known as civil asset forfeiture. And what it does is it allows police to seize assets basing, based on nothing more than their belief that those assets either are being used for illegal drug activity or were purchased with the proceeds from illegal drug activity. They can do this even if they have no basis whatsoever for filing any charges against the person whose asset it was. And no, I am not exaggerating, not one little bit. This is something the ACLU has been fighting for years. In fact, several years ago, I was for a, uh, for a short time, I was part of an ACLU Speakers Bureau, and this is one of the topics I would talk on. The thing is, once an asset is seized, it becomes the responsibility of the person whose asset it was to prove that this asset, whether it's money, a car, a house, whatever, uh, they have to prove that this was not used in or obtained through illegal drug activity. That is, they have to prove a negative, and the burden of proof is all on them. The result of this is that it's become sadly commonplace for cops to just keep money and other valuables that they find during traffic stops under a claim that it's this, these, uh, these assets are the result of illegal activity and therefore can be seized. Such civil forfeiture has a long history. In fact, it was one of the things that sparked the American Revolution. And in fact, the part of the Fourth Amendment about people being secure in their possessions against unreasonable seizure was designed to protect against exactly this kind of thing. Unfortunately, though, even there, it didn't take long for the government to start approving such seizures in cases such as piracy on the grounds that it was easier to go after the ships and the booty than the actual pirates who might be continents away. But even so, despite that approval, civil asset forfeiture was not widely used until 1984. That's the year Congress passed the Comprehensive Crime Control Act. This established a special fund uh, that turned over proceeds from asset seizures to the law enforcement agencies responsible for them. In other words, the cops and the prosecutors could now profit from these seizures because the value of the assets seized didn't go into the general fund. They went to the cops and prosecutors. The result of this? At the Justice Department, proceeds from forfeiture went from $27 million in 1985 to $556 million in 1993 to $4.2 billion in 2012. States were also then uh, producing their own similar asset forfeiture laws. There are now states and localities where major parts of their police budgets are paid for through the assets they seize, including money, um, in fact, there have been some places where this actually became a racket, where police targeted people, particularly people with out-of-state plates, particularly minorities in cars with out-of-state plates, for traffic stops with the specific conscious intention of finding a way to say that this, that this is part of illegal drug activity and seizing their property. Most victims don't get their property back. Most of them don't even try. Uh, they may not have the money to fight. Often enough, the legal cost of getting your stuff back is more than the asset was worth. 
So you got to remember, this is a civil matter, not a criminal one. You have no right to an attorney. So any legal costs involved come out of your own pocket. What's more, a lot of areas put up extra roadblocks. Uh, for example, people often have to put up a bond so that their stuff won't be sold before they can even try to get it back. Then there are fees. Washington, D.C., for example, has a filing fee. You have to pay $2,500 just to file an attempt to get your stuff back. And don't think this is just out there somewhere. It's not. The Institute for Justice did a state-by-state -state study of state forfeiture laws. It was called Policing for Profit. It gave Massachusetts an F and called its civil forfeiture routine terrible. More recently, it's been revealed that in the three-year period, 2009 to 2011, which is the most recent data available, Massachusetts cops and prosecutors have seized as much as $33 million in property via civil forfeiture. Middlesex County officials have seized not only cash, cars, and bank accounts, they've seized cell phones, computers, an engagement ring, GPS devices, and lottery scratch tickets. Despite claims that such seizures are intended to punish drug dealers by taking away their stuff, County DA, uh, his name is Jerry Leone, said the police usually don't seize property that would cost too much for upkeep. He called whether or not to seize property, quote, a business decision, unquote. Meanwhile, among the other law enforcement purposes uh, on which Worcester County spent the money it obtained by seizures were bottled water, attendance at conferences, tree trimming services, and the purchase of a Zamboni. Which, if you don't know what that is, that's one of those machines that smooths the ice at uh, hockey rinks and ice skating rinks. The issue is not just out there. It's right here. So it has become such a sad and common thing to happen. But, but Larry, let me get back to the, to the dairies. The money taken, more properly stolen from the dairies, it was not even theirs. It belonged to a friend in Los Angeles who had saved this money dollar by dollar over a 15-year career as an exotic dancer with the idea of getting out of the business. She kept the cash in a safe deposit box, and the dairies were taking the money to New Jersey where it was going to be used to invest in a nightclub that was going to be jointly owned by the dairies and this friend. Unlike too many other people, the dairies could and did fight back. Uh, two weeks ago, July 23rd, U.S. District Judge Joseph Battalion noted that lots of money, quote-unquote, lots of money is not a sufficient basis in and of itself for a seizure, and that there was, quoting again, no nexus between the currency and any illegal activity, and he called the drug sniff inconsequential. He ordered that the money be returned with interest. So that's good news. This particular story has a happy ending. But too many other times, civil forfeiture has simply been a means for cops and prosecutors to fatten their budgets, and not even to fight the bad guys, but to pay bonuses and buy everything from popcorn machines to boats. In 2000, Congress, responding to increasing complaints about abuse at the federal level, passed the Civil Asset Forfeiture Reform Act. This requires that federal prosecutors prove, quoting, a substantial connection between the property and the offense in order to justify a seizure. Unfortunately, that only applies to federal law enforcement, not to the states. It doesn't apply to Massachusetts. It's long past time for that to lo no longer be the case. If civil forfeiture can't be confined to its original very narrow purposes, then it should be done away with altogether. If local cops want a new popcorn machine, let local taxpayers pay for it. We're taking a break. And here we are back. 
Uh, we're going to go to the second half of the show today, starting off with a couple of updates from things I've talked about before. Uh, first, uh, it's actually the first time about a month ago, I guess it was, I mentioned the Moral Monday protest that had been taking place in North Carolina's state capital of Raleigh, uh, protesting various things that the government there is trying to do. Thousands have participated. Over 900 have been arrested so far in nonviolent civil disobedience. Well, the legislative session has ended, and so the NAACP, which has been the spark plug behind these protests, decided to take them on the road. The first stop was Asheville, North Carolina, and on August 5th, according to local police estimate, somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 people showed up. There are plans for other protests in other cities in the state. Charlotte, tentatively scheduled for August 19th. The intent is to have one such rally in every congressional district in North Carolina. Meanwhile, it appears that the idea is starting to spread. On August 5th, there were Moral Monday protests in both Chicago and Oakland, California. All right, another update on something else. Last week, I gave Lauren Green of Fox News the Clown Award for her Islamophobic interview with uh, religious scholar Reza Aslan, where she seemed incapable of grasping how it could be that Aslan, who was a Muslim, could possibly be interested in writing a book about Jesus, even though Aslan is a PhD in religious studies with a degree in the New Testament. Apparently, I wasn't the only one who thought Green was a clown. BuzzFeed said, is this the most embarrassing interview Fox News has ever done? On Twitter, the New Yorker's Emily Nussbaum called it demented. And the Twitter hashtag Fox News Lit Crit was spawned, full of mock interview questions such as, as a human, Mr. Tolkien, why would you want to write about hobbits? However, there was one place that thought she did a terrific job, uh, Fox News. There, her career is apparently quite safe. On the network's America Live show, host Shannon Bream claimed there's nothing to this whole business, that it was all ginned up by, by the liberal and far-left media. She had Brent Bozell there, is the right-wing media hack. Uh, he was there to say that he applauded Green for hinting that Aslan was biased because he was Muslim, saying that Aslan couldn't be a very good Muslim, although why Brent Bozell is supposed to be an authority on what constitutes a good Muslim is one of the great mysteries of the age. I uh, claimed that Aslan was misrepresenting his academic credentials and couldn't possibly have read all the books he said he'd read. Oh, he also said, Lauren Green is a great person, with which Bream agreed, just before plugging her own upcoming story about people attacking Christians. All right, from there, since I just mentioned last week's Clown Award, let's go to this week's Clown Award, given, as always, for meritorious stupidity. This week, the Big Red Nose is a group award given to some Kentucky citizens who oppose new science standards for the state. It's given in recognition of their striking demonstration of the truly appalling ignorance of right-wingers. Kentucky is one of a number of states considering what are called next generation science standards. The Kentucky Board of Education adopted these standards in June and held hearings last week to get public feedback before it's submitted to the state legislature for approval. The standards were developed uh, from input from officials in 26 states, including Kentucky, and they're intended to make science curricula more uniform across the country. And of course, the know-nothings were out in force to express their utter shock that their dear sweet children were about to be exposed to science. Now, the standards cover a wide swath of science and involve hundreds of points, but there were really just two that were the target of the mouth breathers, and yeah, you can guess them, evolution and climate change. For example, Ma Matt Singleton, a Baptist minister, invoked the paranoid's all-purpose monster, Outsiders, as he denounced the standards as fascist and said they essentially outlaw the right to worship Almighty God because they teach the rich man's elitist, he's really working in all the cliches, isn't he? The rich man's elitist religion of evolution. Evolution, it said, being a lie that has led to drug abuse, suicide, and other social ills by teaching that our children are the property of the state. One parent, Valerie O'Rear, said the standards promote an atheistic worldview and a political agenda that pushes government control. 
W- meanwhile, Dennis Stort Gore claimed that the standards will ostracize religious, uh, religious students and that the standards are socialism, which she said, quote, takes anybody that doesn't fit the mold and discards them. We are even talking genocide and murder here, folks. So in their minds, in these people's minds, science, knowledge, is fa- fascist, atheist socialism that leads to oppression, drug abuse, suicide, murder, and genocide. You know what? Actually, I take it back. These people aren't clowns. They are sick. They are sick with fear of a world they can't grasp, a world they can't control, bringing changes which they can't comprehend. And the fact is, I feel sorry for them. On the other hand, one person who is a clown is Kentucky State Senator Mike Wilson, who chairs the state's Senate Education Committee, one of those that has to approve the new curriculum, and he has made it clear that he thinks global climate change is a lot of hooey. By the way, there is news about climate change. Um, There's news on that front, which I will be getting to next week, I promise. All right, from there, our other regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. Governor Scott Walkallover of Wisconsin is proving, if more proof was needed, that unions aren't his only target. Any sort of opposition is. For two years, opponents of his regime have been standing in the rotunda of the state capitol at noontime to sing songs of protest. Well, recently, Walkallover has decided that he's had enough of this. He endorsed new rules which require a state permit for any gathering of, get this, four or more people and Capitol Police have begun arresting people for their illegal noontime gatherings. Now, in response to a suit, a federal judge has bumped that number up to 20, which seems to miss the point since no permit should be required as long as use of the facilities is not denied to others. But um, that's the number that's going to remain until a trial on on this law comes up next year. To the credit of the protesters, they have not been deterred to gather and sing even as to the discredit of walk all over you, the arrests continue. By August 6th, the number of arrests was up to 160. But what makes this truly outrageous is that Capitol Police have been going up to random bystanders, people, often tourists, who are watching the singing from the gallery above and telling them that they are subject to arrest if they don't leave. Now, the cops don't appear to have acted on that threat yet, but they are putting out the word. So that's right. And Scott, walk all over you, walk all over you, Wisconsin. It's not only illegal to sing protest songs in the state capitol, it may be illegal to watch somebody sing protest songs in the state capitol. We are moving into some really dangerous territory. All right, last thing for today, and I have to do this today. I'm doing this show on August 7th, sandwiched neatly between August 6th and August 9th. Dates which, well, even for people still, I think those dates, if they at least think about it, have some meaning. Early on the morning of August 6, 1945, the B-29 Super Fortress bomber, nicknamed Enola Gay, took off from Tinian Island in the Pacific. It was headed for Hiroshima, a city in Japan of about a quarter of a million people. It carried a single bomb codenamed Little Boy. At 8.15 a.m. local time, Little Boy was dropped. I want to give you a sense of the kind of power we are talking about here. The bomb contained about 64 kilograms, about 141 pounds, of highly enriched fissionable uranium. Of that amount, about seven-tenths of a kilogram, about one and a half pounds, actually fissioned, that is, split, and only about 600 milligrams were actually converted to to energy. 600 milligrams is six-tenths of a gram. It's a little more than one-fiftieth of an ounce. The explosive force released by that one-fiftieth of an ounce of this bomb had the explosive force of 14,000 tons of dynamite. It was enough to do this to Hiroshima. 70,000 people died instantly. Some of them literally vaporized. 70,000 more died by 1950 due to injuries, radiation poisoning, and cancer. Just three days later, Another nuclear bomb, codenamed Fat Man, did this to Nagasaki, with tens of thousands more dead and another city destroyed. 
These two attacks, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were probably the two greatest war crimes the United States has ever committed. War crimes? Yes, and here's why. The bombings were unnecessary, and the excuse trotted out every time the question is raised that the only alternative was a bloody land invasion of Japan is a lie. It is now a 68-year-old damned lie. By the spring of 1945, Japan was already a defeated nation. It no longer had any navy to speak of. Its air force had been decimated, its army driven back to its own shores. It was incapable of mounting any offensive action or even defending itself against U.S. air raids. Critical materials and even food were in short supply. In fact, the situation was so bad that before, before Hiroshima, Japan had already made overtures through Sweden and the Soviet Union to the United States offering to surrender. All this was known to the U.S. military. All of this was known to President Harry Truman, who rejected this offer because it wasn't unconditional. Hirohito would have kept his throne. What's also known to Truman was the USSR's intent to declare war on Japan, and that's likely impact. In his journal about his meetings with Stalin at the Potsdam Conference, Truman wrote July 17, 1945, quoting, he'll be in Japan war on August 15th, finny Japs when that comes about. It was so bad that U.S. analysts sent to Japan in 1946 concluded that Japan would have surrendered by, by, by November 1st, 1945, quote, even if atomic bombs hadn't been dropped, Russia had to, hadn't entered the war, and no invasion was planned. Bombing Hiroshima was unnecessary, and the U.S. government and military knew it was unnecessary. It was a crime, a war crime, one that we compounded by bombing Nagasaki before the, t before the impact of the first bomb had the chance to settle in. The Nagasaki bomb, in fact, was put together in a day and night effort, which raises the question of if the second bombing was in order to force Japan to surrender or to get it in before Japan had a chance to. There is a good reason to think the latter. U.S. officials, including Secretary of State James Burns, Presidential Advisor Bernard Baruch, top military leaders, had urged the bombings as a means of warning the Soviet Union not to challenge American plans for a post-war world dominated by U.S. interests, to, in Burns' words, allow the U.S., quote, to dictate our own terms at the end of the war and make Russia more manageable in Europe by showing our power and that we had the will to use it. The bomb was, as Truman put it, the weapon given us by God to use for his purpose purposes and his ends. Which means, ultimately, that hundreds of thousands of Japanese were destroyed, disintegrated, vaporized as sacrificial lambs at the start of a decades-long attempt to contain the Soviet Union, if not bullied into submission. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not the last shots of World War II. They were the first shots of the Cold War, and the Japanese were the first of its many victims. And their deaths, their unnecessary deaths, were war crimes. I'm going to finish up today with our weekly reminder. As of August 6th, at least 6,905 Americans have been killed by gunfire in the United States since Newtown, at least 70 of them in Massachusetts. Have the best week you can. We'll see you next week.